um, for the morning, guys, on um, group B. Um, so our topic for today is um, high efficiency power production from coal, the carbon capture, and boy, the JT, I mean, and rodent. Um, so a brief description of the process overview. So this is our flow sheet. So basically, this flow sheet has nine processes in it. Um, like you can see the ASCS, the air separation unit, rather air is put into there and um, the oxygen is produced through cryogenic distillation, which is basically like regular distillation but with um, high, low temperature and high pressure. And the O2 produced is used in the gas fire. And the gas that's fired when gasification occurs, which is the production of thin gas from coal with um, oxygen. So the thin gas is mainly made of water, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen. Then thin, ga thin gas is seen in the scrubber. So that's the removal of it, so basically. And there's also thin gas shifting that occurs in the WGS reactor there. Then from thin gas shifting, we have um, the removal of some impurities, because um, thin gas has the main mixture and other impurities like mercury and H2O. So the, the impurities are removed over there. The impurities like mercury, H2O, and, and all that. Then after the um, impurity, we have the power generation. So the power generation, of course, in its anode and cathode area, so the power generated from the solid oxide for sales there. Then we come over here to the spot, the HRSG, which is the heat recovery and steam generation section. So basically, um, steam is generated from water used up in the plant, and water from, like you can see, water generated from everywhere it goes back in, into this HRSG. So steam is generated and sent back into the plant for then our main focus is the CO2 recovery, which is this packet of action and CO2 compression. That's the main focus for this project. So like I said, the CO2, the CO2 recovery is the coil exhaust, which is mainly made up of carbon dioxide and water. It's cooled to 21 degrees and is flashed in the drum. And you saw the couple of flash drums, that's like there are four flash drums there. So the liquid phase is further depressurized and separated in the cascading flash drums. And we have the CO2 compression. Right? So this is basically just the CO2 recovery and compression. The CO2 compression is just the, the CO2 recovered from the top stream here in drum one. And this sends to this um, compressor and this compressor about 74 uh, so we focus mainly on the hazards for everything here, and we focus on this main classroom right here and its surrounding area, including both the cooler one and two, and compressor one there. Uh, we initially started with high and low pressure and how that would affect the classroom. Uh, does anybody have any ideas as to what would cause a high or low pressure in the classroom? No at all. All right. Well, for our, we came with low flash drum pressure could be caused by a low heat temperature or a leakage in the flash drum. <coughs> and then the consequences of this, of having a lower heat temperature would be a higher liquid level, which would then mean there's less vapor coming out the top and possible damage to your compressor that's downstream of drum one at the top. Uh, to remedy this, we decided to install a pressure and temperature controller, one on the feed stream and one on the top Top, the top outlet of the flash drum, and then to remedy the leakage in the flash drum, which would cause low vapor again coming out of the top, we installed a pressure indicator on the flash drum, as well as replacing the flash drum as maintenance requires it should it stop working properly. Then for high, it's essentially the opposite of low pressure, in which we had a higher feed temperature and a blockage in the vapor stream. Now, the higher feed temperature would cause a lower liquid level, which could then cause damage in the pump downstream of the bottoms of the flash drum. We would then install a pressure and temperature controller for the flash drum, which is the exact same as low pressure to, to fix it. And then blockage and the vapor would, be less, would get less CO2 recovered in the flash drum and a possibility for an explosion to occur. And we installed a pressure alarm in order to ensure this does not happen. 
And then here we have our temperature controller operating a valve on the inlet stream to moderate that. A pressure controller on the top stream there, again operating a valve. Then we have our high and low pressure alarm and our pressure indicator on the flash drum. So for the next uh, parameter we chose for hazard study is the level of pressure. And uh, again we have uh, the graduate high and low for this parameter. So we brainstorm uh, we brainstorm a possible process deviation of high level of liquid in the flash drum. So this might be caused by uh, the inlet stream being too cold or if there is any blockage in the liquid, uh, in the liquid stream uh, leaving the bottom of the flash drum. So uh, for the in if the inlet stream being too cold, uh, less vapor fraction is produced at the top of the drum which uh, might result in the possible uh, compressor damage. And to prevent this, we decided to install temperature temperature controller on the pit stream. And uh, we also decided to install that ice on the compressor, since the compressor is so expensive. And uh, as for the blockage in the liquid stream, uh, this might lead to uh, less liquid water leaving at the bottom of the drum. And this might result in, uh, further result in uh, damage of the pump, pumping the, li uh, pumping the liquid water through to the uh, HRSD. And uh, so we decided to install level indicator and high level alarm on the on the flash drum. So uh, another possible process deviation with brainstorm is a low level of liquid in the flash drum. So this might be caused by the blockage in the inlet stream and <coughs> or if the inlet stream being too too hot in the summer. And these two causes will uh, result in low separation occurs and possible damage to the pump. So to prevent this, we decided to install a uh, pressure sensor on the feed stream, uh, temperature controller on the feed stream, and the low level alarm uh, on the flash drum. So here, yeah, so basically the diagram is the same as the diagram shown before, except that we change the, the pressure alarm to level alarm and pressure indicator to level indicator, since uh, the parameter we study here is a uh, the uh, it level of uh, the liquid in the flash drum. And we also added the pressure sensor to the fixed stream. For the operability section of our workshop, we looked at the inlet flow rate into the flash drum. Um, the operability section deals with any fluctuation in procedure that could lead to um, violation in health, safety, and environmental regulation. Also, that could lead to um, negative impact on our product yield. We looked at the operating window from negative 50% to 200%, meaning reduction of our input, our throughput fit by 50% or by doubling our throughput. Um, the safety issues that could arise due to, um, under the reliability section, we're looking at the safety equipment and environmental issues related to it. Um, reliability deals with any um, fluctuation in our process that can lead to failure or the probability of it. Um, the safety issues could be related to pressure buildup in the pipe. That is, if we increase the flow into the flash drum, we'll, have def we'll definitely have a pressure buildup in the pipe going to the flash drum. That could lead to um, safety issues, as we said, and also equipment damage, because we will have bath flow into the valve, damaging the, the valve also can lead to bursting the pipe, which is also uh, damage of equipment. Um, our system deals with um, sequestration of carbon uh, carbon dioxide. So the current system is dealing with 100% efficiency. So if we increase the throughput uh, from the base case, we'll definitely need to have a vent to deal with equipment damage. And having a vent means having um, emission of CO2, which is um, not what we want, because we're trying to avoid breaking uh, environmental regulations. Uh, by increasing or decreasing uh, CO2, or by increasing or decreasing our throughput will definitely um, negatively impact our product yield because when we increase it, we'll definitely have back flow and then have um, lower output in the, at the end of the stream. Also, by when we decrease it, we'll obviously have like a lower throughput through it. So to adjust this, we'll definitely have to either resize our equipment or resize it or get better equipment, which will definitely impact our economic section, which we'll uh, deal with in depth in their report. <laughs> so for our activity section, we're doing um, data slide. I'm not sure how many of you know about this. I had to watch a YouTube video before this. 
Um, so we're going to be calling out numbers, and then we're going to ask you guys to come up to the front. Um, number eight.
the solution of formaldehyde in water gets sent to a storage, gets cooled and sent to a storage tank. So what's really special about formalin mixture, which is formaldehyde in water, is that it has to be stored between 35 and 45 degrees Celsius. That's because if it's too high, you get formic acid formation, and then if it's too low, you get polymerization of the process. Of the Okay, so this is our high simulation of our pasta. Uh, we used an NRTL food package because the mixture of methanol and water uh, is a an, non-ideal liquid. So, um, and as our, as, our, as our reaction is primarily exothermic, we had 40% exothermic and 35% endothermic reaction. And these are the parameters we used in our simulation and Angel is going to go over our, some of our operability case studies. So with observed, uh, when the flow rate of the methanol increase and the mix, the concentration of methanol in the mixture of methanol and earth also increase. Uh, because the permeability of methanol is at 36%, so therefore we have to adjust the flow rate of air in order to operate to achieve the operating pressure outside the permeable rate. And another procedure to observe is when the methanol flow
So if we're in this range, we can have a relatively high formaldehyde concentration from the bottom of the observer and a very low maximum concentration, which is below 1% weight, 1 weight percent. And this is acceptable for maximum concentration. So if we can accept this formaldehyde concentration in our product, we don't really need to use a dissipation column to remove the, uh, the maximum and to recycle it. So this is called the water bath process. And this can significantly reduce our capital cost. Um, so the pie chart on the left uh, describes the process with the distillation unit, and the process or the chart on the right is without distillation and all its associated units. So you can see that it reduces the capital cost significantly uh, by 70% actually, and so this provides a great incentive for all future plants to consider this process. Okay, so this is the PFD for the water ballast process, and you can see the distillation column isn't uh, involved here. However, we do have water being added to the methanol feed stream. Um, so basically, this version is less expensive, like Heather said, and it's easier to operate as there's no recycled methanol feed st uh, stream involved here. Um, however, there's a lower concentration of the formalin being produced. So next, we're going to be looking at the reactor PNIE for safety, flexibility, reliability, and startup. But I'm only going to be talking about the safety aspect of this. So um, two of the most important parameters that need to be controlled for this process are the effluent temperature and the boiler feed water inside the reactor. So um, from the safety hierarchy, the three most important levels that we feel uh, needed to be implemented are obviously controls, alarms, and the SIS. So for the controls, um, there's a level indicated control uh, already as part of, it was already part of the base case, and there's a temperature indicating control as well. Um, which is connected to the S1 stream. Um, and level indicating control is actually attached to the exterior of the reactor and is also connected to the boiler feed water stream in order to maintain the levels inside the reactor. For the alarms um, involved in this uh, PNID, we decided to implement a temperature high alarm and a level low alarm. And lastly, for the SIS, uh, we feel that this is the most important uh, important level in our hierarchy because it, it prevents unsafe working conditions. And uh, we implemented a low, low level switch and a high, high temperature switch. So basically, when these go off, um, the SIS will send a signal to our uh, methanol pump and the air compressor to turn off. And next, the feed valve will, uh, feed valve will turn off. And lastly, the cool, cooling water valve will open, allowing the cooling water to enter the reactor in order to cool down the reactor. Any questions? So this is a class activity we have. Yes. Okay, so we need three volunteers and uh, just, yeah, great, thank you. Um, just based on the configuration of the class so far, we're gonna try our best to split them into three big sections. So one volunteer is gonna represent their section and it's gonna be like a group effort um, everyone's going to help their one representative and so we'll need a representative from each section and that person should stand up um, in wherever they are. Okay, so I guess you can ask what side. So I think we should get two from, we'll split up like the back side and the side. Hello? 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 So we'll need two volunteers. Anyone? <laughs> I'll choose someone if you guys don't want to. Great, thank you, Nikki. <laughs> One more person. Okay, the guy at the back there that's not looking at me. <laughs> Okay, what was the desired methanol composition in the product? 
Uh, also, we get an answer if it was real time of the equity. Uh, yeah. oh, like I want that dollar. Hey, yeah. yeah. that's one. Oh, maybe that's one. 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 Okay, so for the operability section, I'm going to be talking about efficiency and flexibility. 
Um, and this is just an image that compares the um, efficiency for separate generation of steam and electricity versus co-generation. And you can see that the overall efficiency is much higher when we co-generate as opposed to just doing it separately. Um, and basically, CHP systems, which is combined heat and power, um, they utilize less fuel to get the same results. So this results in lower costs and lower emissions. And these are just some efficiency calculations I was doing. Um, P is the uh, power output from a plant, Q is the heat output, and F is the um, fuel input. And basically I calculated it for a bunch of different cases for the energy client demand. And you can see that the trend is positive for the energy client demand for efficiency. This is because the plant is optimized for steam production and electricity generation is just a possible byproduct. So if you're using more steam, your efficiency overall is higher. Um, and also the efficiency can be improved by the use of heat recovery equipment, such as um, a condensing economizer that would preheat the boiler to water or um, something to preheat the combustion air. And now I'm going to talk about flexibility. So this plant is operating 24-7 and it has varying demands. Um, and there are also disturbances that need to be dealt with. So we have some control loops. Um, these are the main ones. The first one is to control the boiler temperature and pressure output. Um, we are going to manipulate the natural gas flow rate going into the boiler. And then the next one is to make sure that we have a constant amount of water in the system. Um, we're going to manipulate the makeup water flow rate um, to make sure that any losses are covered. And the next one is to keep the condenser outlet temperature constant. We don't want any vapor going into the pump. So we're going to control the chill water flow rate going into the condenser. And the last one is energy client demand. So that's going to be varying. And we need to change the, um, the split ratio coming out of the first turbine to make sure that the energy client is satisfied. And then, um, so I was going to talk about another aspect of operability that we kind of found interesting. So that's our startup and our shutdown of the plant. Because our turbines are dealing with steam, they have to have a really thick casing around them, um, just so that um, they can handle that large temperature of that steam. So that's going to cause a large um, thermal inertia, and as well as a large temperature differential between the standing temperature and then the actual full capacity temp temperature of the unit. So therefore, in order to prevent um, thermal expansion during heat up, um, you have to do it very slowly and do it very progressively um, that prevents some damage that could be caused in your turbine. Um, the other issue is with a more of our shutdown. Um, if moisture accumulates within the actual turbine, um, it can cause a lot of damage. It also will help, um, not help, I guess, <laughs> hinder it with um, corrosion. So basically it's really important that we use a purge gas to remove all moisture before it's actually shut down for a long period of time. So just briefly, um, here's the diagram again. So basically our startup's pretty standard. Um, you're just going to start generating um, some steam with your boiler and then bring it into your turbine. You're going to basically try and heat up that pipe first with your vents and drains open to about 80 to 85% of the actual operation temperature. And then you're going to start ramping up your turbine, closing all those drains and vents and actually ramp up your turbines and slowly ramp up the actual LP <coughs> turbine. And then once you get to enough capacity, then you can bring your engine client online. Uh, for shutdown, it's a little bit different because we have to get that purge gas in there. We're going to use either nitrogen or dehumidified air. Um, so as you're starting to ramp down the boiler, you're going to have to replace that steam flow with the purge <coughs> gas and then run the system with the purge gas while everything else is at full capacity. Uh, also have to have that it's not connected back into the boiler. Um, and then you're basically, once it's all purged, then you can slowly ramp down your equipment, making sure all that moisture is removed, and you're also going to slowly prevent um, any damage from ramping it down too, slow, uh, too quickly. So, now it's Derek. Okay, now it's time for our interactive activity. Um, our activity will be Blizzard Own Co-Generation Plant. Before the start of class, I handed out some components of our co-generation plant. It'll be number one or two on it. If there's a one on it, you'll be on the left side over here for the two. We'll be on the right side of the board. Um, our co-generation plant in this case will be a simplified version of a high low pressure turbine, a boiler, an plant, and a condenser. 
So you're responsible for putting them in the correct arrangement as well as drawing the flow lines of what is going to be going in this case. So can those who have those commits please come forward and